It's every parent's question, every child's cry, and every year the stories of crimes against children continue. Every year we still don't know why. Tonight, News 8's Robert Riggs looks at our most disturbing crime. What can we do? What should we do to protect our children? The Enemy Among Us, tonight at 10, only on the News 8 Update. This is the News 8 Update. It's got to the point in society now that you can't even trust your best friend. You can't even trust your brother anymore, hardly. Convicted child molesters reveal what every parent should know about how sex offenders try to weave their way into our lives. Good evening, an exclusive look at some of the most sinister criminals in Texas top tonight's update. The 1993 abduction and murder of seven-year-old Ashley Estelle by a convicted child molester made many parents wary of strangers. But in fact, most child molesters are people we know and we trust. Tonight, Channel H Robert Riggs begins a series of special assignment reports called The Enemy Among Us. It gives parents an inside look at how molesters can win the confidence of a community. I raped five female children. I've also raped one male, two female children. She was helpless against me. Behind the walls of the Ramsey II prison farm, child molesters share their dirty little secrets. I'm a sex offender. I raped three male children, ages. 11 who were friends of my children and children of my neighbors. This first ever public look at the Texas prison system sex offender treatment program reveals a blood chilling portrait of men who will stop at nothing to get our children. If not arrested and incarcerated, I would have escalated to kidnap, beat, murder my daughter and my additional victims to hide in the bodies to fill my rapes. There's not an ounce of empathy for their victims. 4,000 convicted child molesters dream of the day they will get out. Their dreams are every parent's nightmare. I've had 13 deviant fantasies since my last group, two which were against children. <laughs> the treatment program here stresses that child molesters cannot be cured. Some of these offenders can only be taught how to control their deviant behavior. 200 child molesters selected from volunteers undergo an intensive two-year program of group therapy. It breaks down their denial of guilt and recognizes their patterns of distorted thinking. But most imprisoned molesters don't receive any treatment and anonymously return to the streets. Without treatment, prison psychologists say these sex offenders will molest again. As a parent, is there ever a time I can feel safe about a child molester? As a parent myself, that's, that's not a, the only time I feel safe is when my child is with me and my wife. I feel like every mother and father should be concerned, uh, a lot more concerned. Any, it could be anybody. Anybody could be a sex offender. This Hispanic community near Dallas La Field felt safe about the good citizen who moved into their neighborhood of duplexes four years ago. Parents here work long hours to provide for their families. It was nice to have someone who gave children so much attention. Mothers welcome the newcomer with coffee and pastries. The man, who was a self-employed landscaper, let the boys build a backyard goldfish pond. Within weeks of his arrival, he was the neighborhood Pied Piper. All of this was directed in one direction, and that was to get them in to his spider web. And, my goodness, he did that. No one paid any attention to the sign on his porch that warned children about stranger danger. No one even knew his last name or where he came from. He was affectionately called Maurice. <laughs> the new guy on the block helped drive drug dealers away. He worried about the safety of children and championed a petition drive for speed bumps. And he was always, you know, congratulating me about my kids and anything you need, you know, let me know, you know, and uh, if I can be a help, if you need money wise or, or anything. The man was a regular dinner guest in his neighbor's homes, gave vegetables from his garden to moms, gave dads part-time landscaping jobs, gave their boys clothes and toys, and loaded up the camper of his pickup for outings to video arcades and amusement parks. Take them all over. I mean, my kids would, 
You know, oh, we went downtown, Mom. Oh, really? What'd you see? Oh, we went to go see a flick movie, a good movie. Morris took us this. And more. It was always Morris here, Morris there, Morris everywhere. This mother trusted the man with her three sons, now ages 9, 12, and 15. Finally, her youngest confided the awful truth. And I said, I'm, I'm here, and I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to hold you, so don't cry no more. So I ran across the street, and I called the cops, and they came in. Maurice was 54-year-old Morris Goray. Police suspect Goray molested at least 17 boys, some of them the very sons whose unwitting father sat at Goray's hospital bedside when he was sick. Adding to their shock, Goray was on probation for molesting a little boy in Frisco in 1985. This neighborhood was a perfect hunting ground for a child molester. Many of the families that live here are undocumented workers who don't want to bring attention to themselves. Molesters prey upon such secrecy. Victims' mothers say Gore threatened to call immigration if the boys talked. Still, how could a lone white man in a Hispanic neighborhood fool so many parents and molest so many boys? It's a seduction process, whether you're seducing the child, the neighborhood, the families. And again, and it doesn't happen overnight. It takes weeks, months, years, sometimes. I've seen some of these guys take years to do these type of deals. This perverted deception can and does happen in neighborhoods of every socioeconomic class. Wherever children are in need of attention and their parents preoccupied for whatever the reason, there's a master seducer of children skilled at identifying vulnerable victims. We're doing this story to help parents like you and me understand how child molesters are the most clever, secretive, and patient of criminals. I spoke to molesters who spent years and $25,000 to get access to the child they wanted. Tomorrow night, you will hear a molester's own account of how he targets children and their parents. Mm. Uh, Robert, your story mentioned that the child molester, Goray, in your story, uh, was on probation. Now, how could he have so much contact with children? Chip, the Dallas County probation system refuses to answer that question. Uh, while he was living around that Love Field uh, neighborhood, probation officers there knew that he might reoffend, knew that he might molest again, and uh, they had had warnings that might happen. Also, he had repeatedly violated his probation, but it wasn't until he was arrested on these latest charges that they filed a motion to revoke his probation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Well, tonight, a warning for parents from a man who says if a person knows how many children he's molested, then he hasn't molested very many. This man's victims number in the hundreds over the past four decades. Channel 8's Robert Riggs continues his special assignment report, The Enemy Among Us, with an exclusive look inside the mind of a child molester. 58-year-old Buford McDonald could pass for anybody's Texas grandfather. He looks out of place in the recreation yard of the Price Daniel Medium Security Prison. No parent would suspect this friendly man boasts he's one of the worst child molesters to ever stalk the Southwest. McDonald used every conceivable trick. As a ventriloquist, he delighted children at schools and church socials with his puppets. I've never picked on a strange kid because I was a con man. I could work my way into any home, any church, any community, and uh, get, get what I wanted at that time without picking on a stranger. McDonald has been molesting children since his teens. His victims number in the hundreds. We asked McDonald to tell his story to warn parents about the devious methods that child molesters use. And I have a type of personality that I can walk into a strange community. I've never been there before at all, and I can walk out in a group of kids, and I don't know if it's my looks, my tone of voice, or what it is, but in just a matter of, of, a, of an hour's time, they flock to me like a magnet. McDonald lives on a cell block reserved for inmates in protective custody. Child molesters are hated by the most hardened of convicts. On February 20th, Buford McDonald gets out of prison again, convinced he's rehabilitated, but he hasn't received any formal psychological treatment. Chances are, he'll molest again. McDonald's case offers parents insight into how molesters target our children. His diary reveals their special skill at spotting vulnerable victims. McDonald says this ad for children's cold medicine shows what he calls the hunger look. They are literally starved for affection. Maybe 
you can't see it. Maybe their parents can't see it, but the child molester can. It's a look on their face that shows that they will reach out with their hand and they will take an adult's hand. Molesters are master seducers of children. Most have an uncanny ability to identify with children better than they do with adults. If I can get down there and talk two-year-old's language and feel, uh, feel just as hurt and emotional as that child can, or an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old, uh, I, 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 can, I can meet them on their emotional level. And, and they just see me as, as an overgrown kid rather than an adult. McDonald exploited children's needs for attention and affection especially those from broken homes or who suffer emotional neglect. And I was always ready to listen to them. If they had a problem to talk to, I was there. And they found, they found this, in, uh, what they were looking for in their parents, they found it in me. He is the beast. And nobody better than the beast to tell you what the beast is capable of doing. Plano Police Detective Mike Johnson investigates child molestation cases. He says it's not the stranger that parents should worry most about. There's another type of predator who secrets themselves in places where he knows that children are going to be, camouflages themselves, makes himself look attractive, makes himself look attractive to children, to their parents, and what have you, so that he would be the one that is least expected to do this type of thing. Those are the ones that are most dangerous. Parents need to be aware that child molesters are often pillars of the community. Some of the men convicted in Dallas County include a YMCA counselor, soccer coach, school teacher, principal, businessman, and church daycare worker. So-called nice guys next door who were otherwise law-abiding citizens. We see that they uh, are very tricky, that they are capable of uh, looking sincere, speaking with a sincere voice. Lyles Arnold counsels child molesters on parole and probation in Plano. You're a parent short of becoming paranoid. What's a, what's a parent to do? In all likelihood, if your child were to become the victim of a child molester, it's probably going to be somebody in your family or somebody who is a friend or a close acquaintance of the family that you've grown to trust. And so the best thing you can do is to uh, be thorough and uh, Make sure you know the people who are working with your children. When I hear this as a parent and other parents hear it, it's, you scare me to death. And I'm not going to want you out ever to get out of prison or any other child molester. You can do everything that you can as a good father to protect, protect your child. And then, who knows, tomorrow you'll be faced with somebody like me that will come along and, and gain your confidence. Uh, it may be a pastor, a policeman. It could be a, a, a politician or a longtime family friend or family member. And they're going to deceive you and take advantage of you. Parents may soon need to worry about McDonnell. He walks out of prison a free man on Monday. McDonnell has been in and out of prison for the past 35 years for molesting children in four states. Tomorrow night, more on how molesters infiltrate groups that are supposed to help children. Well, Robert, let me ask the question that I think most people have, which is, how can this guy be getting out? He is being automatically released under an old law that says that when you uh, uh, have served uh, a certain number of calendar days in prison, plus the time that you get for good behavior, and that equals your sentence, you're automatically released. And he can move back to your neighborhood, down the street from your son, down the street from my son. No one is going to warn us, and there is no way under the law that we can find out. The law protects his privacy, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Well, that's scary. Okay, thank you, Robert. Scary. Some angry protests tonight over the impending release of a convicted child molester after a report we aired last night. Public outrage poured into the parole board over the upcoming automatic release of child molester Buford McDonald. Last night's special assignment report, The Enemy Among Us, revealed how McDonald targeted hundreds of victims. He was due to get out of prison on Monday. Well, now, in the wake of our report, Police from Santa Fe, New Mexico, plan to arrest McDonald at the prison door. He's wanted for violating parole there on sexually assaulting a child. A child molesters like to say they groom their victims, parents, and entire neighborhoods. They even try to convince a child that the molester loves them more than mom and dad. Well, tonight, more lessons for parents on how molesters set up their victims. Channel 8's Robert Riggs concludes his report, The Enemy Among Us. A Texarkana jury wants 32-year-old Richard Rushing to spend the rest of his life making prison inmates uniforms. 
Rushing shows no remorse for sexually molesting a half dozen of the boys. Most people would like to see you be real miserable here, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you wouldn't get rehabilitated if you were real miserable. You would go out hating society for putting you in here. Let's go, move it! Come on! Rushing was a court-appointed volunteer to keep watch on how Child Protective Services handle cases of abused children. He molested a foster child whom he was entrusted to protect. Also duped the family into relinquishing custody of their two sons to him. Rushing molested those boys for four years. When I think about it, to be honest with you, I get scared. I feel real scared for my two boys. These prison psychologists with the sex offender treatment program say parents should fear the devious nature of child molesters. Because some of them can appear extremely nice, extremely intelligent, and the last thing we want to think about is that guy is a sex offender. He may very well be. When you went to that video arcade, it wasn't really to meet your girlfriend, stalk out children. Child molesters reluctantly talk about their monstrous acts during early stages of prison group therapy. They deny everything and feel nothing for their victims. I, I did everything I could to make myself seem to be this good and uh, an outstanding person. Among them, a respected architect who convinced a state agency that he would make a good adoptive parent. He used the adopted children to molest their friends, 22 children in all. Police and prison psychologists say the public should be warned about where convicted molesters live and work. Under current law, we say the offender has paid his debt to society when he gets out of prison, give him his privacy, give him a fresh start. If you were going home to your community and, uh, and there was a wild tiger that was loose, would you want someone to warn you that it was a wild tiger there? You bet. But if you knew, it may be something you could do about it. You could protect yourself. You could protect your children a lot better. At the Texas Capitol, 22 bills called Ashley's Laws would strip away some of the secrecy that molesters crave, require registration, public notification, and slam the prison door on repeat offenders. State Senator Florence Shapiro introduced the bills after the tragic abduction and murder of seven-year-old Ashley Estelle by a parole child molester. They are the least likely to be cured. They are the most likely to reoffend, and they prey on the most innocent members of our society, our children. We've got to see the uniqueness of this criminal and treat this criminal different than the, the burglar or the auto thief. Under the Constitution, the proposed laws requiring registration, notification, and a scarlet letter on driver's license can only apply to offenses committed after September of this year. Parents must still worry about child molesters convicted before then, and there are thousands of them out on the streets. Let me get by a few minutes. 44-year-old Lawrence Magana of Garland sweeps the prison dormitory where he's serving a 12-year sentence for aggravated sexual assault of a child. Magana used a common ploy of child molesters. He faked romantic interest in women to get their daughters. You're having a lot of deviant thoughts are running through the mind. A child molester spends every waking moment plotting how to fulfill his deviant fantasies. How do I isolate my victim? How do I get my victim? And they, and they go through thoughts in the mind, well, I could do this, I could go and say hi, or to meet the family, uh, would you like to go get an ice cream, stuff like this. First, you, what we call, test the waters. Test the waters to see where, how far you can move. You may touch a child, the child doesn't react, you, you go further. Magana completed the sex offender treatment program. Still, when he gets out of prison, Magana says everybody needs to know he's a child molester. That sex offender agrees that the public should be notified when there's a convicted child molester living in their neighborhood. One of the bills by Senator Shapiro would do just that. John? Well, Robert, what's the response of the lawmakers? John, some apparently don't understand how dangerous molesters are to our children. Senator John Whitmire of Houston, chairman of the Criminal Justice Committee, raised objections about safety zones to ban molesters from around schools because a convicted molester could not visit his child's teacher. As you've seen in our reports, child molesters shouldn't go anywhere near children. We're going to track Ashley's Laws to keep you posted in the coming weeks. And John and Ship, right now, uh, parts of this package appear in trouble. And if people are concerned, they better get on the phone to their this representatives. Is, this has been an eye-opening report. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. This is the News 8 Update.
give probation or parole to a sex offender is only letting it happen again and again and again, whether it be now or later. Once a sex offender, always a sex offender. And to put an end to that, a state senate committee passes a tough bill to keep child molesters behind bars for life. The so-called Ashley's Laws are at the top of the update tonight. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. The proposed laws are named after the seven-year-old victim of a child molester, Ashley Estelle. Today, those laws cleared their first major hurdle in the state legislature. Ashley's 1993 abduction prompted the call for tougher sentences. Channel 8's Robert Riggs reports tonight from Austin. Three-time child molesters would serve the equivalent of a capital murderer's prison sentence under a bill approved by a Senate committee. The blood-chilling account of Buford McDonald, who has sexually assaulted hundreds of boys, helps speed passage of the toughest measure of Ashley's laws. I have a type of personality that I can walk into a strange community. I've never been there before at all, and I can walk out in a, a group of kids, and I don't know if it's my looks, my tone of voice, or what it is, but in just a matter of, of, a, of an hour's time, they flock to me like a magnet. After watching a tape broadcast of McDonald and News 8's recent reports called The Enemy Among Us, the Senate Criminal Justice Committee approved a three strikes and you're out bill. Habitual child molesters and adult rapists would have to serve 40 years in prison before becoming eligible for parole. And even then, two-thirds of the parole board would have to approve an offender's release from prison. Senator Florence Shapiro Plano read from a convicted molester's letter who wrote to support the tough sentence. I'm a three-time loser the last one for offending a minor sexually, which I served five years on an 18-year sentence, for which nothing compared to what I have caused to a girl of 10 years of age. In response to the abduction of seven-year-old Ashley Estelle from a Plano soccer tournament by a parole molester, the committee approved child safety zones. The bill would prohibit convicted child molesters from going near schools, playgrounds, daycare centers, youth centers, video arcades, and from participating in youth activities. Shapiro confirmed that a review of home videos shot at the soccer game where Ashley Estelle was kidnapped identified numerous offenders. It was horrifying to many that the police recognized other offenders in the park and no one could do anything about it. Bills calling for a beefed up registration of child molesters and public notification of their whereabouts were sent to subcommittee for further work. A recent study found that one-third of the sex offenders that are supposed to register under current law have not. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Austin. And, and our job is to keep our society free from predators of our children and sex offenders. Governor George W. Bush signed into law an automatic life sentence for repeat child molesters. Ashley's laws crack down on the most manipulative and sinister of all criminals. It's a system that let convicted child molester Michael Blair out on early parole to strike again. Blair abducted seven-year-old Ashley Estelle from a Plano park during a soccer tournament two years ago and murdered her. Plano State Senator Florence Shapiro named the new laws after Ashley and says it could have saved her life and other children if such a law had been in effect years earlier. I will say to the Estelles that Ashley's death was not in vain, that maybe because of what happened to Ashley, these laws were put in place and that's the reason I put her name on them, and that there will be children's lives saved in Texas as a result of what happened to Ashley Estelle. Under Ashley's laws, convicted child molesters like Buford McDonald would have to serve 35 years before becoming eligible for parole. Two prior felony convictions for attacking children, plus a third conviction for any other felony, triggers an automatic life sentence equivalent to that for capital murder. Ashley's laws also requires public notification and registration of where a molester lives. Sets up child safety zones to prohibit convicted molesters from going near schools, parks, and other places where children gather. It notifies the victim if a molester receives probation or escapes from prison. Lets the victim appear in person before the parole board to oppose release of the molester. And it lets law enforcement agencies share more information about molesters. If you apply, apply them to any of the children that have been killed by sex offenders in the recent years, I think there are a couple of three laws that, if, if applicable back then, would have saved children's lives. Ashley's laws may become a model for the nation. The Office of Attorney General Janet Reno has invited Senator Shapiro to Washington next month to discuss how the FBI can set up a national registry to keep track of child molesters. 
Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Austin. Amber Hagerman could have been any child in any neighborhood heading off for a carefree bike ride. But on a sunny Saturday afternoon, the little nine-year-old was like an innocent minnow in the sea, unaware of a circling shark. While a lone witness watched from his distant backyard, a man driving a black pickup snatched Amber kicking and screaming. The random blitz style of attack is a telltale sign of a predatory criminal. It's the hunt. When you interview them later on, it was the hunt and the kill that was the most, uh, the most thrilling. And uh, even the part where you're eluding the police. The Retired Special control. Agent John Douglas pioneered criminal profiling by the FBI's elite investigative support unit. In the late 70s, Douglas and then partner Robert Ressler went into prisons interviewing and studying the most dangerous criminals across the country. They learned what makes child abductors tick and develop techniques to link how they committed their crimes to what's going on in their minds. They'll keep going uh, until they're, uh, they're caught. There's, there's no burnout for people like this. Just as a killer may leave a fingerprint at the scene of his crime, he also leaves a personality print. The FBI's official profile describes traits of Amber's killer as impulsive and explosive tempered. Stress in his life preceded the murder, such as rejection, loss of his job or place to live, money problems, a troubled relationship. He may have lived or worked near where Amber was abducted or her body was dumped. He probably missed work on the days after the Saturday, January 13th abduction. If people start putting two and two together, they, they say they, hopefully they'll, they'll think, hey, this seems to fit the pattern I heard on this news show. Douglas paints a picture of more peculiar behavior by the killer. He spends lots of time cruising around. He probably missed at other abduction attempts that have gone unreported. He abused alcohol to build up courage for the abduction. His friends have noticed sudden changes. People around him will see an increase in, uh, in drinking and uh, to the point where uh, he's not going to talk about the, ca the case, but, but he will be, there'll be preoccupation th through the media and uh, he will become very, very paranoid. Looking over his shoulder, someone knocks on the door, he jumps, he hears a siren, he, he gets very, very nervous, and, and, uh, and, and people would have, would have noticed a change in, in his behavior, as well as a change, in all probability, in his appearance. I went to the video store, because I knew there'd be a lot of uh, children. The motives of Amber's killer can be seen inside the Texas prison system sex offender treatment program. That would have the kidnapping would be him. Deviant sexual fantasies consume most of their waking hours. In fact, the fantasy is a planning session for reality, one that can turn into a sadistic murder. She cried, she hollered, uh, she pulled me in my eyes, she hit me with her fist, she tried to run. I was still going to get what I wanted. Controlling a child makes them feel powerful. Murder is the ultimate form of control. The prison throw their hands up with a, a, a dangerous... Uh, a child killer, a child abductor, and they, they know that these people cannot be rehabilitated. Retired Special Agent Robert Ressler conducted the FBI's first research on serial molesters and abductors. Ressler says our society has become a crime factory producing more and more monsters. It comes from uh, uh, absent fathers, uh, abusive, cold and distant mothers, uh, an environment where the kid grows up in, a, in an emotional void and uh, uh, their, their fantasies that develop very early in life become destructive and violent uh, as they become older. Long before a child abductor ends up in prison, there are many warning signs early in his life. Often a so-called homicidal triangle of bedwetting, arson, and cruelty to animals. As a result, they tend to be, uh, they tend to be loners, they tend to be introverts, and oftentimes they, they leave very little clues behind. What kind of truck is it? Arlington police have received more than 1,500 leads, but so far have made no arrest. But the moment the suspect thinks the heat is off, one thing is certain. They'll kill again. Uh, they'll go back out on the hunt again. Uh, may not be in your area. He may leave the, leave the area, go to another part uh, uh, of, of your state. But uh, there is that cooling off period. That's the definition really of a serial killer. Arlington police are using the FBI profile to narrow the list of potential suspects. But there are more than 1,000 sex offenders on parole and probation in Tarrant County alone. It's an overwhelming task to compare the profile to those large numbers. 
And John and Tracy, you could have a situation here where these offenders are very mobile and transient. He could have already left, could have left a string of victims in other states. I, I'm curious, Robert, you say that on the day of, the, of Amber Hagerman's uh, murder, this person was drinking. How do they come up with such specific details? Uh, you know, these portraits are amazingly accurate. They look at the dynamics of the crime, the circumstances, the abduction, the body's location, autopsy information, witness reports, even the time and the weather. They then compare that to this body of research they've collected from interviewing some of the most notorious serial killers of our time, Ted Bundy, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. From that information, uh, they know there is a pattern, and they then can become to draw this portrait of a offender that most likely committed this crime. And in the case of alcohol, they know from this body of research that they've collected that in these types of crimes, uh, the offender has been drinking heavily to try to build up courage to do this abduction. What do you have for us tomorrow night? Well, tomorrow night you'll hear firsthand from child molesters how they prey on their victims and what parents should guard against. Thank you very much, Robert. My twisted mind told me that I was going to set a record and see, how, see if I couldn't molest more children than anybody else. Buford McDonald makes a chilling admission. He is a five-time convicted child molester, in and out of prison for the past 18 years. McDonald is considered dangerous and likely to attack again. You can walk up to video games where, where children are out, and you can just look around, and some, kid, some kids will just look up at you with a, with a hunger look in their eyes. Like they're just dying to have somebody reach out and touch them. McDonald kept a diary detailing his sly and patient ways of picking out and enticing his victims. He used ventriloquism and puppets to get close to children in schools and church youth groups. After serving just seven years of a 20-year sentence for aggravated sexual assault of a boy, McDonald has been set free again. I'm tired of prison life. I'm tired of what I've done. Like McDonald, 2,000 of Texas' worst sex offenders will be released from prison during the next two years without serving their full sentence. Under an old law called mandatory release, those inmates automatically get out when their credit for good behavior plus actual time served adds up to their entire sentence. Texas' most dangerous child molesters can then move into neighborhoods without families knowing about it because new registration and public notification requirements known as Ashley's Laws don't apply. McDonald committed his crime before Ashley's Laws went into effect. They're not retroactive. You can't protect your children completely. It's a, you can do everything that you can as a good father to protect, protect your child. And then, who knows, tomorrow you'll be faced with somebody like me that will come along and, and gain your confidence. Uh, it may be a pastor, a policeman. It could be a, a, a politician or a longtime family friend or family member. And they're going to deceive you and take advantage of you. The 3,800 child molesters in the Texas prison system come from all walks of life. One here was caught offending at age 76. Prison psychologists say they are the most self-centered, manipulative, secretive, and heartless of all criminals. They may not be who you think. It has affected their lives. We have many people in a program that can be regarded as in quote pillars of the community. The Texas prison system has geared up to try to teach molesters how to control their deviant behavior before they get out on mandatory release. Psychologists say there's no cure. Most imprisoned molesters refuse treatment. It's extremely frightening to us because we, we very much believe that they're at a high risk for reoffending, and we think that society also believes that as well. However, if they don't want treatment, if they're not interested in it, um, you can't force someone to go through a treatment program. And now two little girls, Ashley and Amber, are dead. The outcry over Ashley Estelle's murder by a convicted child molester out on early parole brought about passage of tougher laws. We should know that, baby. Amber Hagerman's abduction has set off petition drives spreading with wildfire intensity for Amber's amendments, calling for life sentences without parole and the death penalty. Once again, a mother and father are pleading for justice and protection from child molesters. We're going to have to get rid of them. We're going to have to put them to death. We can't have them walking among us. News 8 has run an exclusive poll on what laws should be passed in the wake of this tragedy. We'll have the results tomorrow night of a public opinion that will weigh heavily on Texas lawmakers. And uh, John and Tracy uh, Buford McDonald, who we mm -hmm. told you about earlier in that uh, story, uh, Last seen headed to Arkansas. Arkansas.
Well, just how, how dangerous are these the people on this mandatory release? These truly are some of the worst of the worst. Uh, before 1992, the parole board was secretly releasing some of the system's most violent offenders, even serial killers, to make uh, room in the prison system, which was overcrowded. And uh, these people were too risky to, to release them. But, Robert, is there anything now that can be done to stop the, these mandatory releases? In the last session of the legislature, there was a very active uh, crime victims group out of Houston that pushed an effort to try to abolish mandatory release retroactively. It was, mm -hmm. it was soundly defeated in the legislature. Lawmakers were worried about the constitutional rights of the child molesters. And they're going to make another attempt next session. All right. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thank you, Robert. It was a crime that shocked North Texas, the abduction and murder of Amber Hagerman. A News 8 poll commissioned since her death fined six out of ten North Texans support a mandatory death penalty for child molesters. Journalist Robert Riggs joins us now with the details. Robert? Johnny Tracy. This week, News 8 conducted a poll of 650 North Texans selected from a random sample. In the wake of Amber's murder, there's no tolerance for giving child molesters a second chance as we find in the conclusion of our report, The Enemy Among Us. Such unspeakable and fiendish evil has stricken one of our children. We wonder what kind of monster could commit such a horrible deed. Whoever killed nine-year-old Amber Hagerman took something from all of us. Tragically, he gave us something, too. An outrage that is galvanizing public opinion. There's got to be something wrong when you hurt a child. Since Amber's murder, families have mobilized petition drives for a war against child molesters. Already, thousands have signed, calling for life sentences without parole and the death penalty. And they want the governor to call a special session of the legislature. Amber's parents urged Arlington lawmakers to act now. And it's a shame that our children have to be in prison and these animals are out free. It should be the other way around. America's been too nice too long. And now it's time to get tough and get these guys off the streets. How do you make parole with your record? What Amber's parents and many others want done is to put child molesters to death. An exclusive poll commissioned by News 8 found that more than half of North Texans surveyed agree. 57% favor a mandatory death penalty for convicted child molesters. Under current state law, the death penalty is reserved only for murder. That of a child under six, a police officer or firefighter, or murder while committing another felony crime. Lawmakers are unlikely to add child molestation to that list because of constitutional concerns. But News 8's poll found 69% of North Texans say child molesters should forfeit their constitutional rights. For so long, we were dealing with sex offenders, with child molesters, as though they were the same type of criminal as a thief or a burglar. The murder of seven-year-old Ashley Estelle two years ago changed that. The little girl was abducted from a Plano park by convicted child molester Michael Blair. Blair's tape police interrogation revealed he was a human predator out of prison on early parole. There's evil inside him. There was then, I'm sure there still is now. And, and once you catch a glimpse of that, it's it's hard to to be able to sit there and try to talk to someone like that. In response, Senator Florence Shapiro pushed a dozen bills through the legislature called Ashley's Laws. Our job is to keep our society free from predators of our children and sex offenders. In signing Ashley's Laws, the governor put a beefed up sex offender registration law on the books and required police to notify the public about sex offenders in the newspaper. And police are supposed to tell school districts about sex offenders living nearby or juvenile offenders in classrooms. But police cannot publish the sex offender's name or exact address. Why do they put this back there so far and why is it so little? This ought to be on the front page of the newspaper in big letters. Amber's parents complain that the notifications are buried in little red legal notices. Police say some newspapers are gouging them on prices for the ads. 
News 8's poll found that 87% of North Texans surveyed say newspapers should publish the exact names and addresses of convicted child molesters as a community service. And 94% believe parents should have access to the names and addresses of convicted child molesters living near their child's school. By law, citizens have the right to receive the sex offender's name by making a written request. But there's reluctance by some police departments and schools to release the names out of fear of legal liability. My greatest concern is we need to be on the side of the law-abiding citizen. We need to be on the side of the, of the children. And we need to make strong laws to protect them. And that's what Ashley's Laws does. Senator Shapiro plans to seek even stiffer sentences for child molesters in the next session. And she wants to open up the records of juvenile sex offenders like Michael Blair who slipped through the system. Also, uh, John and Tracy, under Ashley's Laws, it's, it's virtually impossible now for uh, an imprisoned uh, child molester to make parole. It, it takes like a two-thirds vote of the 18-member board, and, and they're not letting them out. Now, Robert, you're telling us that people are frustrated because they can't get the name of a sex right. offender, and then it's very difficult for them to get the address. What about other states? What do they do? I think in the next session, we're probably going to see Texas try to follow the model of California and New York, where they have a 900 number where you can phone in and pay a $15 fee. You get all the information, the name, the exact address, and then they'll mail you a photograph. Hmm. Thanks a lot. Brian. Can you describe this guy to me that you saw? For a month now, the Arlington Police Hotline has fielded hundreds of calls with tips about the killer of nine-year-old Amber Hagerman. But the manhunt remains frustrated by the lack of a computer tracking system for the nation's most baffling cases. These types of offenders are very mobile today, and if you have them moving from county to county, uh, we don't have a very, very good system of communication between law enforcement talking and sharing with each other to show similarities in, uh, in cases. John Douglas headed the FBI's elite investigative support unit that has assisted in profiling Amber Hagerman's killer. For years, Douglas pleaded to Congress for a computerized system to help solve violent crimes. But we'd have no system now. We have to go back now in a case like this and search by hand all over through every state and every jurisdiction to see if there's any similarities uh, in modus operandi and signature. Serial killer Kenneth McDuff left a unique criminal signature in the way he abducted and murdered at least a dozen young women in Central Texas. But it took law enforcement agencies in neighboring counties three years to realize they were looking for the same killer. If we had a system in place, we could cut these guys off at the pass when they're in their early 20s. But if you don't catch them in your early 20s, you let them live and go, go on into to their late 20s, they're going to perfect the MO. It's going to make it much more difficult to apprehend them. And along the way, they would have molested, raped, murdered a lot more victims. Arlington police have been digging through hundreds of criminal records of sex offenders on parole or probation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But without a national computer tracking system for such cases, the clues to Amber's murder may lie in an unsolved case in another town, county, or halfway across the country in another state. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Arlington. Well, it's somewhere. The murder of Amber Hagerman whipped anger into action. The mother of the nine-year-old girl works on a recipe for keeping child molesters behind bars. Volunteers prepare for a bake sale. A newly formed group called Parents Against Sex Offenders, or PASO, needs office supplies to keep mounting a petition drive for stiffer sentences. The petition also demands that the governor call a special session of the legislature. More than 20,000 people have signed up thus far, urging the governor not to wait until the regular session in January 1997 before lawmakers can consider tougher laws that could protect our children. The case of imprisoned child molester Richard Rushing underscores the need for laws aimed at criminal predators. The once respected Texarkana firefighter became a court monitor over child protective services cases as a ploy to get little boys. Plano Police Officer Mike Johnson says any organization that serves children should require training against the tactics of molesters. And defenders that target youth groups should not get a second chance. We're telling our children, you go to school and you listen to what your teacher says or you listen to what the counselor says, you do what they say, that type of thing. That is giving these perpetrators power over our children. 
and they know what they're doing when they join these facilities. That's going to be a pretty smile now. Wow, that's a pretty smile. Way to go. Girl. Amber's abduction sent shockwaves throughout the Dallas-Fort Worth area. More than 100 children were photographed and fingerprinted for an ID every parent prays they will never have to use. Yeah, these are really good things to have. The Trinity Medical Center in Carrollton sponsored a child safety seminar. One mother says her three-year-old daughter now takes the warnings to heart. It really had an impact on her, what happened to Amber. And she was afraid, and she asked me questions constantly for two weeks. Mommy, is, Am is Amber an angel? You know, things like that. Um, but I now know that everything I've said to her has, has sunk in. I think we're going to hang it on the building. Amber's family raised a banner in Arlington as a reminder that a cruel killer is still on the run and that more legislative work still needs to be done. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Arlington. She, she wouldn't like come here and I just went no and it was really scary. 11-year-old Catherine of Irving had a brush with the driver of an ominous dark colored pickup. A man tried to lure the sixth grader using the ploy of looking for a lost dog. And I told him I, I hadn't seen one and then he motioned me to to get in his car and I just yelled no and I ran home. I think it's made us aware of the fact that they're never old enough that you can turn your back. Catherine was just a few doors from home on her way back from a neighborhood park. Irving police are investigating for any links to the abduction and murder of nine-year-old Amber Hagerman. If they find a suspect in Catherine's case, there's little police can do. Child molesters can try to lure, entice, or persuade a child into their car or home and it's not against the law. It's not a crime until the molester abducts or assaults the child. Well, I think a lot of these individuals understand very well what, um, what we may or may not be able to do. Uh, it's not uncommon when we deal with these individuals they have a lot of literature uh, that they may read uh, on how we work, on our practices, on the laws. Look at that old finger there. How about that? In the wake of Amber's abduction, Carrollton Police Officer Paul Wilford taught safety programs to area schools. He's shocked that many children don't report attempted abductions. Children told me about people who had followed them. And I followed up, did you tell your mom? Well, no, not really. Did you call the police? No, not really. So I tried instilling these children, tell somebody and have somebody do something about it. It's important for children to speak up and be on guard. Experts say Amber's abduction has triggered other child molesters to believe their deviant sexual fantasies that they can get away with murder. Gloria? Oh, Robert, your report revealed it's not against the law to lure a child. Is anything being done to change that? Case in point stirring up a change is that the last de December, an Arlington man tried to lure a 12-year-old girl in South Dallas into his truck. Dallas police came out, found out that he was already out on bond for molesting a little girl over in Tarrant County, but they could do nothing. They have now written a law, and they're looking for Texas lawmakers who want to sponsor it. Wow. All right. Thank you very much, Thank Robert. You. Nearly three months have passed since nine-year-old Amber Hagerman was snatched off her bicycle in broad daylight by the driver of a black pickup truck. The murder case has stumped Arlington police. On Monday, they will confer with other departments and look for links to unsolved cases. Arlington's search for a suspect has focused on convicted child molesters. He's more of a predatory uh, type of uh, animal. Retired FBI agent John Douglas is one of the world's top experts on such crimes. Douglas cautions that sex offenders whose victims were adult can't be ruled out. What's surprising to me, too, is sometimes when you start trying to link cases, uh, you'll see the, cho the, the cases may not always target children. You'll see subjects like these target children sometimes, and other times that they may be uh, targeting a, a adult women. Douglas believes the killer left a unique criminal signature in where he chose to dump Amber's body. Her unclothed body was found four days after the abduction in this North Arlington Creek. It's wedged between a subdivision and the Forest Ridge Apartments off Green Oaks Boulevard. It's not a place that's just stumbled upon. Douglas says someone here, more than likely children who play nearby, has seen the killer. So the nature of the beast is, is to, is to uh, go to areas where they feel the most comfortable and, and uh, now, what I mean by that is the areas the most comfortable is areas where they've been before, uh, they've been to the area where the disposal is, or they've been in the area where the, ab where the abduction uh, uh, took place. And it's that kind of like the home turf advantage. The witness to the abduction described a black Ford pickup with a short wheelbase. 
That description fits a Ford Ranger. Consumer research obtained by News 8 for that model black pickup matches some of the FBI's profile of the killer. Marketing research dubs the buyers yahoos. Nearly 90% are men aged 18 to 34, mostly blue-collar workers. They are couch potatoes, don't lead an active lifestyle, hang out in sports bars, and are not clean-cut. They wear longish hairstyles, prefer T-shirts and jeans, and wear boots or athletic shoes. FBI sources say Arlington's investigators should have shared more information and compared notes with other police agencies before the trail grew so cold. Early in the investigation, police speculated Amber had been kept alive for two days. Forensics experts who have reviewed the case tell News 8 there's no evidence in the autopsy and crime scene photographs to support that. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News. WFAA TV. This is the News 8 update. Certainly in a, in a location close to where, where the victim was located. Uh, we don't know that it's in any way related to the crime. The killer of nine year old Amber Hagerman might have left a taunting message for Arlington police. Good evening. New information about the case tops the update. Thank you for joining us. Nearly three months have passed since nine-year-old Amber Hagerman was snatched from her bicycle and dumped in a drainage ditch. Now, News 8 has learned that Amber's killer might have left a mysterious drawing behind at the crime scene. While investigators and forensics experts differ on the significance of what was found near Amber's body, there's no question that potential evidence was sub subsequently destroyed by Arlington police. Channel H's Robert Riggs has this exclusive report. The killer of nine-year-old Amber Hagerman may have left his calling card near her body. News 8 has learned that this red spray paint now covers where Arlington police found a mysterious drawing. Forensic psychiatrists who interpret such drawings believe it pictures the killer's view of his crime. But shortly after Amber's body was discovered, Arlington police destroyed the original with red spray paint to conceal its existence. And the potential is there that it is evidence and we're treating it that way and there shouldn't be any more or less significance placed on it because of that. The girl's body was found lodged at the base of where a culvert empties into this North Arlington drainage ditch. The two foot square drawing appears a few feet away, waist high, on the thin concrete wall of a culvert. Look directly at the drawing and turn your head slightly right and down and your eyes rest on where Amber was found. Descriptions provided by federal law enforcement sources to News 8 indicate there's strong reason to believe it's the work of the killer. This isn't something that you would normally see through graffiti. Buck Ravel headed the Dallas FBI Bureau and formed an evidence response team for similar cases. If you found uh, graffiti like this and a body nearby, would it cause you to draw a connection? My preliminary determination would have been this is probably connected and I would want to have it forensically examined. We don't know that it has any value at all. It, it may be, as I said, completely unrelated to the case. If it is related to the case, then obviously it has some evidentiary value to us. If it is the killer's handiwork, he either lingered at the crime scene to make the drawing or returned to the scene before her body was found. Some people are driven psychologically to leave behind uh, some indication, a, a signature on the crime. Uh, and it may not be that they're trying to taunt the police. This may be how they get their gratification by reenacting this through the depiction itself. Arlington police hope to use the drawing to eliminate false confessions. There have been 12 so far. Why was it painted over? Uh, just simply because of the nature of it and the, you know, the potential that it was, it was of evidentiary value and it was something we didn't at that point want in the public domain. Anderson says Arlington police took detailed photographs and a sample to identify what was used to draw it. How important would it be to preserve the actual drawing or piece of graffiti that's on that wall? With tools that are available today, uh, I think it would have been a better practice to have actually sliced out that portion of the wall, taken it and preserved it in evidence. Uh, and then uh, you could probably have more minute detail as to exactly the strokes, the the measurements and the links and so forth. That's not an important uh, wall and could easily be replaced. Why, why didn't you just, they just cut it out? Yeah, that, that was discussed and it was just uh, not, not believed to be, to be necessary at that point. I mean, once we documented it and we have uh, you know, a sample of what was used to draw it, it's, uh, having the actual drawing, we didn't feel like after, after a discussion really was, was going to be that helpful. You know, we've done that in the past on several occasions. Uh, I mean, we've cut out entire pieces of concrete out of streets if we needed them. And this is the way the scene looks today. Shortly after News 8 first inquired about the existence of the drawing, 
Arlington police return to the scene to scrape and chisel away all remaining traces of the artwork. Artwork that might have represented a killer's twisted vision of how he got away with murder. Arlington's police spokesman says they're perfectly comfortable with destroying the original drawing. They say investigators followed the FBI's guidance. But FBI sources familiar with the case say it's inconceivable that the Bureau sanctioned the destruction of potential evidence. John Tracy. Well, Robert, let me look ahead a little bit. If this drawing is connected, could its destruction, if it's connected to the case office, could its destruction create problems for a prosecution? Buck Ravel didn't seem to think so. He thought that a state judge would allow this to be introduced into evidence, the photographs. But what you have lost, according to some of the top forensic experts we've talked to in the country that are specialists on interpreting drawings, is that if they had the original, they could look at the, the brush strokes or whatever the medium was it used to, to do it with uh, and, and tell more about the criminal profile or personality of this person and perhaps even help determine uh, if it is a killer, if it has a killer's personality uh, associated with it. And, and they tell us it's one of the most shocking things, you know, that they have heard of in terms of a drawing like this. And it's very rare to find something like this at a crime scene. Okay, Robert, thank you very much. Amber Hagerman's mother made a direct appeal today to whoever took and killed her daughter three months ago. Channel 8's Robert Riggs reports that Donna Whitson challenges the abductor to have the courage to write her. Amber Hagerman's killer or killers. You can't hide forever. You will not get away with this. Donna Whitson appeals for answers from her daughter's killer. She's writing an open letter to be published in local newspapers. Maybe his heart will change or something. He'll write me back. Maybe he'll feel sorry or, or something and he'll write me back. The hunt for the nine-year-old's abductor remains unsolved. Amber's mother says she's losing patience that the killer will be caught. Hers is the same question in everyone's heart. Why Amber? I want to know how you decided to pick my little girl. A silent menagerie of stuffed animals memorializes the third grader at her cramped Arlington apartment. The sound of innocence used to breeze through the windows here. Whitson wants the killer to know they robbed everyone of a sweet and especially bright child. She wants to learn more about who stole the love of her life, more than the sketchy description of the predatory driver of a black pickup offered by a lone witness. Only the killer can satisfy her. He owes, he owes it to me to answer these questions and tell, tell me where he took my little girl and what he did to my little girl. Whitson plans to rent a post office box in case the killer replies. Mommy Sugar, stop she vows to keep writing until someone answers why her daughter was murdered. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Arlington. The mother of nine-year-old Amber Hagerman ties her late daughter's favorite doll at graveside. The abduction and murder last January struck deep fears about the safety of young children. It's been so long now. And I'm just full of anger because the killer's not caught yet. But. The six-month-old case represents the rarest type of abduction and the most difficult to solve. In its wake, parents rushed out to get ID cards and other means of protection for their kids. But a top FBI expert on child abductions warns more than half of the victims are teenagers. And I believe that an adolescent child is at far more risk of being abducted and sexually assaulted and murdered, or any of those, than a pre-adolescent child, simply because they are of sexual interest to a much larger pool of offenders. Veteran FBI agent Ken Lanning says better programs need to be geared to warning teens. Lanning trains and helps frontline troops who investigate and prosecute crimes against children. More than 600 gathered for a week-long seminar presented by Dallas Police and the Children's Advocacy Center. Lanning is a member of the new Federal Missing and Exploited Children's Task Force. It's tracing the path of known perpetrators of child abduction to see if there's a link to other crimes. Well, basically what it will do is hopefully solve some of these cases, at least resolve it in the minds of the parents. Even if, God forbid, the child is found dead, at least the family will know that their child was murdered. Uh, and then who did it? Between 50 to 150 children are abducted and murdered by strangers annually. Lanning cautions that stranger danger is one of the least likely bad things that's going to happen to a child. A child is much more likely to be sexually victimized by a family member or an acquaintance than by a stranger. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Dallas. 
system refused us access to ADSEG units and refused to provide a list of inmates who were free. State Controller John Sharp obtained a partial list of inmates set free from ADSEG. The prison system destroyed two years' worth of documents in an apparent violation of the Records Retention Act. You can't just simply say because of Ruiz, uh, we let a violent criminal out to, to make room for a nonviolent criminal that subsequently went out and raped someone. Our review of Sharp's records found that 87 inmates freed from ADSEG are now fugitives wanted for new violent crimes, including four murders, four attempted murders, 12 rapes, seven child molestations, five child abuse cases, and 29 armed robberies. Countless more inmates released from ADSEG are back in prison serving new sentences. One of them is Servando Pachicano, convicted of killing one of two women that he kidnapped from a Fort Worth optical store in 1990. Pachicano left 41-year-old Cruz Torres bound and gagged in an abandoned building. Torres, a mother of four children, suffocated. Pachicano went on a violent crime spree in Fort Worth just eight months after he was released from a prison cell block reserved for the meanest of the mean. Lionel will leave the prison system under a cloud of controversy just as Controller Sharp launches a massive audit. Sharp took the unusual step of asking District Attorney Ronnie Earle to assist and investigate any allegations of criminal wrongdoing. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Austin. Sharp signed a, con a contract today with DA Earl to help investigate the three and a half billion dollar criminal justice department. The controller also started negotiations with B.R. Blackmore and Associates of Dallas to conduct the comprehensive audit.